Good evening, everyone. Thank you for being here. When I was putting this presentation together, I was reminded of movies back in my home country in India when I was growing up in the 1980s. In the 1980s, the movies that India produces, lots of movies, and but all the movies in the 1980s had just one formula. In every movie, there would be two brothers, both heroes. They would both get separated when they were small kids because of the bad actions of the villain. And 20 years later, when the boys had grown up, they would get reunited again, put a happy family all over again. And in between this entire 20 year period, there would be about 10 songs and 15 dancers and many beautiful women. So every movie had the same formula. For a while, those movies worked. But after a while, not surprisingly, uh, the audience has obviously decided that it was far too predictable. In many ways, the travel industry today is going through a churn, which is for a similar set of reasons. So the topic that you see here, when I use the term vanilla travel, what it means is that it's saying, boring, repetitive, and we see that in many aspects of the travel industry and we'll get to that in a while. There are three broad themes that I'm going to cover in my presentation. One is a view that I and many others hold that the traditional travel and hospitality industry is in some ways in deep trouble, if not dying. I'm sure that's a controversial statement, but we'll get to that in a while. The second thing is, and it's happening because information and data is the new currency and the old world hotels and airlines and tourism boards are not able to adapt to this new currency. That's the second theme of my presentation. The third theme is, how can empire strike back? The old world hotels, airlines, they have a lot of assets, they have a lot of power. Can they strike back and what do they need to strike back? Those are the three broad themes in our presentation. Why is why are they in trouble? But before I answer that question, I have a question for the audience here. What is the favorite flavor of ice cream that you eat? What's your favorite flavor of ice cream? Any volunteers? Vanilla, okay, vanilla. Berry, cherry, cherry, strawberry, chocolate. If I, the two gentlemen who said vanilla, I'm going to ask them, if I give you vanilla, if I give you vanilla ice cream for every meal, breakfast and dinner, every day, 365 days a year, will it remain as exciting? It will not. And that is fundamentally the problem that's happening. The reason why people, a lot of kids grow up liking vanilla, but soon, very quickly, they graduate to chocolate and strawberry. They want toppings of all kinds. So obviously, vanilla means repetitive, boring, no surprises. And that is the fundamental issue facing the travel industry today. First, let's start with one shocking fact. Look at two companies in the hospitality industry or travel industry. Hilton, a good name from the old world of hospitality, and Priceline. Let's look at two sets of startling facts. Hilton has $9 billion of assets. Priceline has $195 million of assets. 50 times. But if you compare their profit margin, Priceline is 27%, Hilton is 4%, seven times more profitable. So there, these two companies are just one pair of companies that are, like, that are testimony to this particular fact that there is something that the new age companies are doing which is fundamentally different to the old age companies. And this in some ways is symptomatic of the problem that the travel industry, the hospitality industry is going through today. And that is at the heart of the problem. 
Let's look at some more factors. Why should they be in trouble at all? There are more people traveling than ever before. One billion, that's the number of people who traveled outside their country last year. Look at the curve, it's all going upwards. So why should hotels be in trouble? Why should airlines be in trouble? There's no reason for them to be. People are traveling more, partly because the cost of travel has gone down dramatically, thanks to our many friendly low-cost airlines. There's also a lot of supply of different kinds of rooms. Your Airbnb has suddenly brought many more rooms to the market. You have the rise of the boutique and eco boutique segments going dramatically in the last few years. So you have a lot of people traveling. There's a supply of rooms. There's a low cost of air travel that's coming. So it's not surprising that one billion people traveled overseas last year. So why are these people in trouble? Let's look at the underlying behavior of the travelers. People are now traveling very differently. There's a large segment of the population, particularly from the big countries who travel for shopping. Chinese travelers devote 50% of their budget to shopping. There are others who travel to new places because of food. They go with the intent of saying, I will discover new places to eat and I'm going essentially for the purpose of food. And there are others who are adventure tourists. And there are people who, and how many of us in this room genuinely believe that when I travel, Wi Fi is more important for me than anything else in the hotel that I go to? And I can say it from my heart because the hotel I stayed in last night, I struggled to get good Wi Fi. And I'm sure that many of you empathize with that. So, fundamentally, people are now traveling for many different and varied reasons. And people no longer want vanilla travel. And the traveler, the consumer, has fundamentally changed in many ways. And the old world hospitality firms, travel firms, airlines have not kept pace with the changing consumer. And that's the fundamental problem. The traditional industry is still focused on physical assets. Look at what ha look at what's happening. All of them are focused on saying, how can I compress my seats in economy, reduce the seat pitch, and all of us, I'm sure, dread the thought of getting a middle seat in economy when we travel, and that's an outcome of them trying to optimize their cost. The innovation that they come up with is again in their physical aspect. So you come up with premium economy, and in premium economy now, the innovations are all about how can I make premium economy more interesting? Or how can I get the consumer to pay $50 extra, 50 euros extra for an aisle row seat or a seat with extra leg space? So the innovation is all in areas which are to do with physical assets. Whereas the consumer or the traveler is behaving completely differently. Here's a mystery for you to solve. There are three pictures that you see. Which hotel is this? The three pictures, not surprised, I think Hilton's tower, three identical looking rooms. So you have consumers who want differentiation, who want uniqueness, and here is every hotel trying to create rooms that look alike. Why will the consumer remain loyal to a hotel like this or hotels like this when rooms have become a commodity? When a room is a commodity, where will the loyalty come from? I spoke about the difference between Hilton and Priceline. Look at a whole series of contrasts. Priceline, its market value is more than Hilton plus Starwood plus Marriott put together. And you have Airbnb more than Hilton, Expedia more than Intercontinental, TripAdvisor more than Acorn. So very clearly, here's a battle that has been lost. Why is this happening? It's happening because information and data is the currency that drives today's travel economy and the old world companies have not kept pace with that. Now when I say that information and data is the new currency, there are two aspects to this. One is that the new age internet companies simply have a lot more data. Because they are on the internet, the number of interactions on this website, with the apps, through transactions, they simply have a lot more data. The second is the way to use the data. 
all of us who go and make purchases on Amazon or any other e-commerce site have seen the power of recommendations and personalization. When Amazon makes a recommendation to us, we end up buying things that we did not intend to. So very clearly, that data is being used by Amazon and other e-commerce companies in a way that tends to the things that you possibly invested in and you end up buying. So that data is being used very, very differently. And that is fundamentally the problem. Let's dive deeper into this. Let's put ourselves in the shoes of a consumer or a traveler today. Today, when any of us decides to travel, we are inundated with choices. I'm planning to visit Japan, where should I stay? There are 18,000 hotels to choose from. I'm going to New York, I'm going there for the first time. Where should I get a great meal? There are almost 12,000 restaurants there. Where should I shop in London? There are almost 40,000 stores and retailers there. The same with books, same with movies. So as a consumer, one would start off by imagining that there is so much choice available that it's difficult. But no, because choosing from such a massive number of choices is not easy. So take what happens. If you try and make a booking at a hotel, Here's research that shows the amount of effort that you need to go through. One, hotel reservation. The average effort is 45 minutes of time spent, 6 to 12 reviews read, average of 10.2 searches. This is what an average consumer goes through. So what happens? Here's a consumer who feels miserable about it. So very clearly, when you're surrounded by so much information, life is not easy. And when life is not easy for the consumer, here's what the price lines, Expedia, TripAdvisor, what have they done? They have discovered the power of recommendations and personalization. And this works. If you look at the power of recommendation, here's research that shows 35% of Amazon sales today comes on account of the recommendations they make. So data-driven recommendation is driving 35% of their sales. People trust other friends to give uh, suggestions more than a salesperson in the store, 10 times. 27% of hotel bookings are today made through recommendations. Netflix in the US, 75% of the movies that people watch, the movie selection is based on recommendations. Simply put, the power of recommendations is massive. If the internet companies are doing this, why are traditional hotels, airlines, tourism boards not doing this? And this is the genesis of the problem. Why don't they do it? Part of the reason is they do not have the data. They just don't have the data. Look at what happened. An average consumer, any of us today, how much time do you spend in a day engaging with a hotel or an airline? Very little. At the most an hour, particularly when you're traveling to Berlin for the show on occasions like this. What would be the rest of the day? You're at work, you're sleeping. For as much as 12 hours in a day, you did one of those things. Your life is today in the digital world. And the traditional hotel, airline, restaurant has no clue what you're doing in the digital world. They don't know what your behavior is. They don't have access to that data. They have simply no ability to influence their decisions. That's why the power is with the internet first. But when I say they don't have enough data, here's a comparison. The clean circles that you see here is a measure of how much data they have. So 15 years ago, a hotel or airline had this amount of data with them. They certainly have more data today in their CRM systems or ERP systems. But is that data important? Is it large enough? The yellow circle shows the amount of data that is outside the hotel or the, the hotel or the airline. That data is in the social media world. 
is sitting on other review sites. Bulk of the data is lying outside the data. So, if you have a hotel or an airline running CRM programs today, loyalty programs today, or high end analytics, so what you get a very small portion of the data. And when you run even extremely sophisticated analytics on that data, or what uses it? Because it reflects only a small portion of that consumer's life. And this is the heart of the problem that they don't have enough data and they're running analytics on data which is very, very limited. CMOs, marketing heads, admit the fact that they're not prepared for the data explosion. Particularly when the world of digital and social marketing has become so important. And but there is one advantage that airlines, hotels, tourism boards have, they actually know your past history. For example, only an airline knows, for in my case, that I always look for an IC card package. Only an airline knows that when I travel long distance, I indicate my preference as vegetarian meals. Only an airline knows that when I watch the on in flight entertainment, I almost always watch action movies. Google does not know that. Facebook does not know that. Twitter does not know that. Only a hotel knows that when I go and stay and I indicate my newspaper preference, I stay Wall Street Journal. Only a hotel knows that at the bar that I go, I order red wine and not anything else. Twitter does not know that. Facebook does not know that. Likewise, I travel once in two months to Singapore and Dubai. Only the authorities in that country know that I spent three days in Singapore every month or three days in Dubai every other month. And on my immigration form, I say business visit. The advisor does not know that. So there is radical information from the internal transaction data that only a hotel or an airline or a tourism board. Is how the empire can fight back. They have something that Google or Facebook or TripAdvisor or Expedia will never be able to get their hands on. So, this is the way in which the empire can actually fight back. And it's possible. they could not do it all these years because the technology was not available. What's available today in the last few years are technologies which are called the big data technologies. And the fundamental framework, bear with me while I walk through a couple of kinds of concepts. Data is in four different places. There is data about the behavior of the consumer, which is what a bank or a hotel or a airline has. That's a past book. There is data about the person's taste, which is there on review sites. When you go on a review site and say, I like this kind of food, or I like this kind of travel, or this kind of holiday destination, that's available on review sites. Influence data. When you decide to take a vacation to a beach, maybe because the spouse influenced you. When you decide to go to Disney, maybe it's because the kids influenced you. Social media knows what decision is influenced by what, and there is context. What big data technologies allow a hotel or a, a airline to do is to bring all these four silos of data together, so suddenly they have access to all this data which a Google or Facebook or Expedia do not have, but that is the power of the technology. And the way that technology will then work is, this is how it works. Imagine you're planning your next vacation. You love Japanese food. That's your taste. The influence. New York Times gave a particular place 4.5 rating, and you say, I must try this. That's the influence that is exercised on the decision. Context is, it's a full day weekend, and you know you want to take a short vacation. The behavior is, you say, I've been to beaches three times recently, so I don't want to go to a beach again. How a human mind works. What big data technologies now make possible is to use algorithms that take into account taste, influence, context, and behavior to create a super powered recommendation engine that a hotel or an airline can use to influence their guests. Therefore, it will allow a hotel 
or an airline to go beyond the mandate. So then what happens? Look at the number of emails you get from a hotel or airline. I have a friend here who gets continuously emails from a hotel in the US which say, I will give you parking credits if you stay at my hotel. The point is he does not own a car. He does not use a car when he goes there. So why is the parking credit useful? So he stops reading that email. The same with an airline. When I travel a particular airline, I will not name that airline. I get an email which says, thank you for the booking. Here are a few hotels for you to suggest, look at. Here's a car rental option. They don't give me anything else. I'm not interested in either of those. Because the locations I travel to, I stay with a friend or a family. I don't drive in the US, so I don't rent a car. So why would I stop looking, even bother to look at the place? So I stop looking at the place. But what's now possible is by using the technology and the algorithm we spoke about, you can actually give people ideas that make sense to them. You can give personalized pointers for travel, which literally you're holding their hand and taking them along a journey that they're happy about. One of the things that is possible using this technology and which we have done, we have aggregated a billion tastes across the world, across 15 categories, and across travel, food. What happens now is if a bank, if a hotel has to, or a, imagine you are a builder and you have a guest who's made a booking for a travel to Singapore. Hilton knows from its loyalty program that in the past, your site, when you went to a resort of theirs, you signed up for a yoga activity. Hilton knows that you like certain kind of food. And Hilton knows something else from the loyalty program. Using big data technology, what certainly happens is, it's possible to say, this person may like this kind of food. Should I suggest to him that when he visits Singapore, he should make a trip to Bali for a yoga activity? When he's going to Singapore, can I suggest certain kind of shopping for him? So suddenly you're able to personalize and do things that were otherwise not possible. So this is the way they apply and strike them. You can actually create personalized items, exclusive shopping bags for each guest. So if someone's traveling, a hotel or airline can say, here's a personalized food trail for you. Here's an exclusive shopping trail for you. Here's a custom itinerary for you in the city that you're visiting. So you can actually do what the internet companies like Amazon, etc. have done all these years. So suddenly the hotels and the airlines have the power to do this. You can actually say, we believe that in the coming years, it's possible to offer each guest a rate that is customized, decor that is customized, menus that are customized, activities, the room can be customized and amenities can be customized. And that is when the empire really would have spread back. Two examples. Over the last couple of years, we have a hotel chain in Europe where we had an opportunity to deploy these concepts in practice. And over that period, this hotel has seen 1.5x increase in repeat visits. This is a chain of hotels. 15% of shift from OTA bookings to direct bookings. And 18% higher frequency of guests coming back. So it's possible to make tangible difference to a business of a hotel by doing this. A similar project is currently happening for one of the largest tourism boards in the world. Where every time, today what happens is that people travel to a new country. You can go there for three days or five days, depending on how long the location is. And you do things that are pretty normal and come back. That you do not necessarily enjoy the full range of experiences that country or city has to offer. It's possible now by personalizing it. If I know that you love green bashing, I know you love seafood or you love water activity, to create a customized experience for you by which the tourism board of the country can get a higher share of money. So this is the future for the traditional enterprises to fight back. Thank you very much. Uh, my colleagues and me are here.